Good afternoon. Welcome back to UCSF uh, Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm Bob Wachter, Chair of the UCSF Department of Medicine. Welcome uh, again to our live audience in our department and throughout UCSF, as well as our friends in our partner sites in the UCSF Health Network. Uh, as is our uh, usual practice, uh, we will post this video at about 7.30 p.m. tonight on YouTube. I will tweet out the address uh, and uh, our prior grand rounds that we've been doing since this started have been viewed more than 300,000 times. So that has been terrific. A few quick ground rules, the same as usual, put your Zoom screen in, in uh, Zoom window in full screen mode. If you have questions, put them in the Q&A box. And my colleague, Quinny Chang is monitoring those and will uh, pitch uh, some of them to me. Uh, unfortunately, a virus continues its rampage through towns and cities uh, throughout the United States and the world uh, causing an enormous number of deaths now up to about 140,000 in the U.S. and nearly 600,000 in the world, as well as uh, exacting a terrible toll in illness, both acute and chronic. On top of that, we've seen a massive disruption, social disruptions, economic, psychological disruptions with significant disparities. If you think about it, uh, this means that the two most important questions in the world right now are how does SARS-CoV-2 spread from one human to another, and what are the best ways to stop it? Uh, you might uh, challenge me and say, uh, when are we gonna have an effective and safe vaccine? And I, I would grant you that is also a very important question. But we'll focus on the first two today. Uh, how does the virus spread and what are the most effective ways of stopping it from spreading? Uh, we're very uh, fortunate to have three experts, world experts in this to uh, speak to us today. Uh, one from UCSF, two from other institutions who are joining us. The three uh, speakers are uh, Don Milton. Don is Professor of Occupational and Environmental Health at the University of Maryland School of Public Health based in College Park, Maryland. Uh, Don has served on multiple advisory boards for, uh, for journals, as well as the NIOSH Indoor Environment, uh, Environmental Team. He's one of the world's leading experts on the way that infections spread through the air, which turns out to be uh, a hot topic. Uh, he'll focus his comments on this, particularly on the question of droplet versus aerosol spread and why this distinction is crucially important. Our next speaker will be Monica Gandhi. Monica is well known for, to those at UCSF. She's Professor of Medicine, Associate Division Chief for Clinical Operations and Education in our Division of HIV Infectious Disease and Global Medicine, uh, based at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. She also is the director of the UCSF Gladstone Center for AIDS Research, CIFAR, and medical director of the HIV clinic, Ward 86 at San Francisco General. Um, Monica's research is focused on identifying low cost solutions to measuring antiretroviral levels in resource poor settings, uh, as well as many other topics. But like many of our HIV researchers, she's uh, added to her focus, uh, how do we uh, prevent COVID, and she's taken a particular interest in the role of masking, not only preventing infection, but potentially uh, mediating the kind of infection that people get. I should also mention that Monica, just last week or two weeks ago, uh, co-chaired the, uh, the International AIDS Conference that was held here in the Bay Area and, uh, and, and broadcast virtually. And having been the program director myself of the 1990 International AIDS Conference, I know what a massive undertaking that is. So congratulations, Monica, on a very successful conference. Thank you. Our third speaker is uh, Michael Edmond. Mike is Chief Quality Officer and Associate Chief Medical Officer at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics. He's also a clinical professor of infectious disease at Iowa's Carver College of Medicine. Uh, Mike is a leading expert on the epidemiology of healthcare associated infections and public policy implications of infection prevention. He and his group have uh, been strong proponents of the use of face shields. Uh, and an interesting uh, practice and one that we'll hear more about when Mike speaks. So really looking forward to a wonderful uh, session on uh, really one of the central issues that we're all struggling with right now. So uh, our format will be this, each of the three speakers, first Don, then Monica, then Mike will give uh, lectures uh, lasting uh, uh, around 15 minutes uh, with some slides. I'll follow up with a couple of questions for each of them. And then when all three are done at 12.50 or 12.55 or so, we'll take about 20 minutes going to 1.15 for a uh, discussion with all three of our experts. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with uh, Don Milton. Don, you are on. And you're on mute. Ah, uh, good. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Um, 
So it's a great pleasure to be here today and to be able to share some of my perspectives with you on uh, infection transmission and um, uh, infectious droplets and drops and aerosols. Next slide. So um, what are the transmission modes generally of respiratory viruses? Well, they fall into generally three categories. Contact where there's patient to finger or fomite to finger and then finger to eye, nose or mouth transfer to inoculate mucous membranes. Uh, splash and spray transmission where ballistic droplets get a direct hit in your eye, nostril or mouth and inhalation exposure where one can inhale uh, inhalable aerosols, thoracic aerosols, or respirable aerosols. And we divide aerosols into these three categories because it's important. Uh, it, it, it depends on size as to where they can deposit in the respiratory tract. And we'll come back to that uh, and as you can see in this illustration, one of the key roles of masks is that it reduces the amount of respirable aerosols and pretty much eliminates the uh, larger aerosols and splash and spray generation from uh, infected persons. So next slide. Uh, in comparison with uh, known aerosol transmitted infections. So often you hear about people contrasting what's happening in uh, COVID-19 with measles because measles has a very high dose generation rate, a very high uh, basic reproductive number. Um, and uh, it targets cells in the airway um, and in the alveoli so that it can initiate infection when deposited at various levels in the respiratory tract. And in terms of environmental sampling, there's only one attempt that I'm aware of that has been made to detect the RNA in the air. Uh, it was done at Wake Forest by Werner Bischoff and his group. They were unable to culture it from the air but they were able to easily detect the RNA on surfaces. Um, because of this massively high generation rate, two to 10 infectious doses seem to be being generated per minute. Uh, incidental contact is important. Long range transmission has been evident in some settings, but usually people uh, are nearby, but you can pick it up, especially when it's not prevalent that people have been infected by a source at a distance. I haven't seen any studies looking at face masks in measles. Tuberculosis is a completely other end of the spectrum of airborne infection. It has a very low rate of infectious dose generation prior to HIV. Uh, and uh, talking about instead of two to 10 per minute, less than one to about one infectious dose per hour. The target is in the alveolus. So aerosols have to be in the fine particle size that can reach all the way to the alveolus to cause infection. And uh, aerosol sampling is uniformly negative in TB, except when you have somebody cough directly on a sampler that's placed in a confined box so that you don't get too much dilution. Uh, it's easily detected on surfaces. And for this reason, up until the experiments in the early 19 or mid 1950s uh, that Riley performed uh, in the Baltimore VA showing that you could infect guinea pigs through the ventilation system, it wasn't conclusively understood that it was potentially airborne. And now we understand that it's an obligate airborne infection. The uh, reproductive rate is quite low relative to, influ to measles. Uh, and uh, historically, most transmission was recognized as having required prolonged close contact. Long range transmission was only evident in the United States anyway, after 
it was no longer endemic. And recent studies have shown that face masks are quite effective, reducing about two thirds of the virus, uh, uh, the bacteria shed into the air so that um, uh, protecting sentinel guinea pigs used to study the tra airborne transmission. But note here that we have something that is, we know airborne transmitted, it's easily detected on surfaces. Um, the R0 is not very high uh, and it's very difficult to detect it, much less culture it from the air. Sound familiar? This is uh, one of the famous uh, experiments done by William Wells early on. Uh, I think this was in the 40s. He actually did this work showing that when he generated tuberculosis aerosols in defined particle sizes, that he could only infect experimental animals if it was in respirable particle sizes. So where does SARS-2 virus bind? Well, the, the most recent work on this looking at ACE2 receptor distribution shows that we have lots of receptors in the bronchus, we have receptors in the alveoli and in the conjunctiva. And we'll hear more about face shields and eye protection in a little bit. And this emphasizes why that's important. There's also a lot of receptor present in the oral mucosa, thus uh, we are vulnerable through that route as well, potentially. There's probably more to this than just having ACE2 uh, expressed on the cells. Uh, in cell culture, we know that, for example, uh, expression of certain proteases on Vero cells uh, very much increases their uh, susceptibility to infection and uh, production of virus after infection. Uh, the next slide, we see the, uh, the, the deposition pattern where uh, things deposit on the left axis, you see the respiratory deposition uh, fraction and by particle size on a log scale. So you see between about 10 or 15 and 100 microns, you can inhale it, it'll deposit in your nose. As it gets smaller, we begin to get things into the tracheobronchial tree and then eventually into the alveolus. Uh, but when we get down to the size of a naked virus, the deposition drops off because the lung is not a very good filter at that size. So um, uh, this gives you an idea of where these deposit, even at these uh, moderately small sizes of a few microns, most of it's still landing in your nose. Next slide. Uh, so there's two ways to define droplets and particles that carry respiratory viruses. The medical categories tend to be respiratory droplets and aerosols with a definition of aerosols that says that they are only things less than five microns in diameter and everything is bigger than that is a droplet assumed to deposit close to the source. Uh, in an exposure science, uh, we look at it very differently. We recognize that uh, we can inhale things up to 100 microns and they don't get past the nose as the previous slide showed. We call those uh, inhalable aerosols um, that, that somewhat, that smaller aerosols starting at around uh, 10 to 15 microns uh, can get past the nose past the larynx into the trachea and main stem bronchi. We call these thoracic aerosols. And then finally, aerosols that deposit all the way out in the terminal bronchioles uh, and alveoli. And these are respirable aerosols. And in air pollution, you will frequently hear them referred to as PM10, which is more or less the thoracic fraction and PM2.5, the respirable fraction. So this is very much in contrast to the medical categories. Next slide uh, shows the settling time of droplets in still air, which shows that 10 microns and smaller can remain suspended for many minutes in still air. Uh, as you get larger, uh, it, the, the residence time in air is only a few minutes. But, next slide. 
if you have movement of the air indoors and indoor air is not still, uh, droplets can travel much farther than two meters. Uh, as shown here, if you have very low velocity of five centimeters per second indoor air, a five micron particle will still travel about 65 meters, a 10 micron particle 15 meters, a 20 micron particle four meters. And when you begin to get a little higher velocity, you have a fan blowing, an AC system running, then things begin to be able to move very far. Even a 30 micron particle can go five meters. So the two meter cutoff doesn't make a whole lot of sense from an aerosol physics point of view. But with turbulence, rather than just purely directional flow, you're not going to see it go that far. What you're going to see is that it's the main effect of this is it's going to remain suspended in air for a lot longer. Just the thermal plume off of a human body is enough to carry upwards a 50 micron droplet. It's, it, the, the upward velocity of air from around your body is greater than that of the settling velocity of a 50 micron droplet. Next slide. So one of the things that we keep getting asked for is, well, we need a randomized controlled trial of transmission. Well, I encourage you to look at this paper that was published on Monday in PLOS Pathogens. We've tried to do that with influenza. And uh, in this study, we inoculated volunteers with an H3N2 uh, and then had them spend four days, more than 12 hours a day in close contact with uh, uh, volunteers who were also sero-susceptible to this uh, GMP virus. But the volunteers who were inoculated were not shedding very much virus into the aerosol as we were collecting the aerosol shown by the, the uh, Gesundheit 2 sampler up in the upper right. And, uh, but they had lots of virus in the NP swabs and the CT values were in the mid 20s. Still, even though they spent four days together with susceptible volunteers, we were only able to get very minimal transmission. Now, granted that we inoculated people in the nose with the virus, and we know from work done at Fort Detrick in the 1960s uh, that, uh, and, and before that, in orphanages in New Jersey. And in the 1960s, they were using Maryland penitentiary prisoners. When they in, used the same virus to infect by aerosol, it took a single TCID50 to cause infection in a serosusceptible subject, and they got full-blown flu symptoms. It took hundreds of TCID50s to cause infection by nose drops, and usually people were totally asymptomatic, just zero converted, and tens of thousands of TCID50s to cause any symptoms, and then the symptoms were usually mild upper respiratory infections. Next slide. So um, what do we know about aerosols and SARS and MERS? There was a report in the New England Journal in 2004 about the Amoy Gardens apartments outbreak, which is a very unusual setting where a fecal aerosol was apparently generated. Um, there was a lot of question about was there direct contact, were there elevator buttons pushed? Many of the cases were in the, the building E that was the uh, epicenter of the outbreak, but um, the, the, the pattern was hard to explain as to why people in building F, G, A didn't get infected, whereas people in C and D especially uh, were very heavily affected until this computational fluid dynamic model of how airflow was occurring at the time of this outbreak uh, seemed to explain it. Also, a multi-zone model of the building showed exactly where infections happened. MERS has been cultured from a sample in the air outside of a patient room uh, in South Korea a few years ago. Uh, so there is some data uh, suggesting aerosols are important in some settings with SARS and MERS. Next slide, with SARS-CoV-2, uh, air sampling in 
uh, Singapore, whereas the initial study was not able to detect it, a follow-on study in the same unit was able to detect uh, SARS-CoV-2 using a more extensive and well-designed sampling out uh, setup, uh, especially uh, with the work of a postdoc who has expertise in aerobiology. And there we saw that there was considerable aerosol uh, in the uh, one to four micron and the larger than four micron particle sizes. Next slide. In a report from Wuhan uh, with uh, expert industrial hygienists from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology using a, a, a personal samplers, they were able to detect uh, viral RNA in very small particle sizes. Uh, no one's cultured it from the air yet, but then again, no one's cultured measles or TB from the air either. Next slide. Uh, this is from uh, the Sant Tiarpa preprint uh, showing that uh, they were getting RNA on uh, area samples, but the striking thing to me was the very high concentrations that they picked up on personal samplers. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, uh, a analysis by a group of engineers and infectious disease experts from Hong Kong University of the Guangzhou uh, restaurant outbreak where they've done tracer gas studies and careful modeling and video analysis of where people in the room were and how long they were there, which shows that the aerosol would have been contained in the back end of the room based on the way the air circulation was, was working in that room and that uh, infection appears to have occurred over distances of almost five meters. Next slide. Uh, so I mentioned earlier the work uh, at Fort Detrick in the 1960s um, where they showed the, the importance of not only the dose of influenza, but the root of influenza and suggest that influenza is an anisotropic infection. The root makes a difference as to how severe the illness is, not only the dose. Uh, and you'll notice that on this uh, cough collection device here, it says Gesundheit on the side. So when I developed my device here, we called it the Gesundheit 2. Next slide. And uh, this uh, device uh, is a dynamic aerosol sampler, which collects coarse aerosol up to 80 microns, uh, fine aerosol down to 50 nanometers in size. Um, and we have been able to culture virus uh, from uh, the breath of a study we did with 142 uh, influenza cases and estimate that the aerosol generation rate from influenza cases is about one culturable virus particle per minute. Um, and that the uh, coughing was associated with increased shedding, but coughing was not required for shedding of RNA or infectious virus that we could culture. Next slide. We use this device to study masks as source control in this paper in 2013, where we had paired samples uh, from each subject with and without a mask and show that masks pretty much eliminated the coarse aerosol greater than five microns, but um, only reduced but not eliminated the aerosol in the fine particle fraction. But it was cutting it by a about a factor of two, a little more than two. So overall, it cut out two thirds of all the virus uh, being shed by these subjects. Next slide. This same device was used by uh, colleagues in Hong Kong and published in Nature Medicine earlier this year, looking at coronaviruses, seasonal coronaviruses. Uh, unfortunately, these are not all paired, some of them, but not all of them are paired samples. And given the wide range of shedding from individuals, uh, one has to take the finding that it completely blocked fine particle aerosols with a grain of salt. But clearly it appears that this, what works with flu is working here with coronaviruses as well. Next slide. Um, 
we uh, the one we are now ongoing doing these studies with COVID cases at the University of Maryland, uh, and hope to be able to present soon results of these studies and our attempts to work with Matt Freeman and his BL3 at Baltimore with his long experience with cultivating coronaviruses to see if we can culture it from air. Thank you. Great, thank, thank you, Don. Um, a yeah, ton of questions. I'm gonna give you one or two, but then we need to move on. Um, still trying to uh, noodle over what the implications of these findings are for for uh, masks and which type of masks one needs. I think, you know, people sort of understand if it's mostly droplet, then you require one kind of mask. If it's mostly aerosol, that may or may not work. Uh, so just sort of in terms of practical clinical decisions that a doctor or nurse needs to make about what kind of mask and where, where the risk is, how would you distill that? I would say that, um, well, you, we're talking about there are two situations here. There's general public and then there's in the healthcare setting. And in the healthcare setting, we tend to have, uh, especially here in the U.S., less so in some other places, uh, high air exchange rates in patient care areas, even if not airborne isolation units. Uh, our hospitals are supposed to be the to give air changes. So we should get a, a great deal of a dilution by that so that the aerosol is contained in the near zone, close to the patient. And uh, if you're outside of that near zone, uh, you're, the, the, the exposure is gonna to drop to quite low levels. And what we're seeing is that um, the suggestion that this is a lot more like TB than like measles in terms of the source strength of aerosols. The people are shedding some, and if you're up close and for a long time, then there's a real risk of aerosol exposure. But uh, farther away, uh, and certainly the other thing is, one thing we have going in healthcare is that often we're seeing patients later on in the illness when we know they're already making a response and it's difficult to culture the virus from them. So these things I think are adding up to protect us in healthcare. Thank you. Um, and I'm sure the static is on your end or my end, but uh, we'll keep on for a sec. Um, the question about uh, airplane flight comes up all the time. So based on what we now understand about spread, what, what you tell people uh, about plane flights and what do you do? Well, I heard Tony Fauci being interviewed on the JAMA blog the other day saying he wasn't about to get on an airplane and I'm not either. Okay. And the reason why based on... The, well, the um, I was part of the Airline Cabin Environment Research Center of Excellence for FAA 20 years ago. And, uh, you know, I un understand something about airplane cabins. The large jets are pretty much all HEPA filtered, but because they're blowing the air down from the top and out the bottom, they're fighting against the thermal plume of the heat from people's bodies, which wants to take the air up. If they would reverse the airflow and take it from the floor up, safer. hopefully they're going to do that someday. Um, but I think we're going to we're going to we're going to actually we're gonna stop because your I think your audio is uh, is a problem right now. So I think Kyle's going to work with you to that. and let us go ahead and move on to uh, uh, to our next speaker. So our next speaker is Monica. Uh, Gandhi will bring Don on at the end and we will uh, talk through some of the other issues that have come up, including including fomites and the role of ventilation. So uh, Monica, I've already introduced and she's going to talk to us about the uh, role of mass, including some potentially exciting uh, new thinking about that. Hi, well, thanks for having me here. So um, we're going to talk about how COVID-19 severity may um, be dose dependent, essentially, and then that will be late to masking. So next slide, please. So the outline of this, next slide, sorry. The outline of this, um, while we're waiting for that to advance, is that I'm gonna talk about kind of an age old theory um, that uh, the dose of virus that you get in actually determines how sick you get. Um, and we're gonna talk about that issue of the viral inoculum and the severity of disease and the theory behind that.
and how masking would then decrease the viral inoculum. Um, and then we'll talk uh, a little bit about if asymptomatic infection is increasing under mask conditions. We can mention San Francisco and other countries. And then we'll talk about um, the possibility of population level immunity resulting from that. So I think we're still waiting for um, the slides to advance. Sorry, should I wait a minute or should I? What do you keep going? We're, we're working oh, on Okay. So then, um, so one question that comes up is what is the rate of asymptomatic infection now um, and in the world? <laughs> um, and right now, the, the, the most likely rate that we have with asymptomatic infection with SARS-CoV-2 is about 40%. And uh, that comes from really well-designed studies like um, the study that was done by Dr. Diane Havlier and Karina Marquez and Gabe Shamey here that mass tested the mission district that you presented here in Medicine Grand Rounds. And then not only did they mass test everyone, but they followed them out for two weeks. And by doing that, um, so go to the next one and then the next one. Thank you. So by doing that, you can really um, say, okay, how many people are asymptomatic if you follow them out for two weeks? Were they pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic? And the rate was 42% in their study. And then two days ago, the CDC came out with this number that mirrored what um, Dr. Havler's study had shown, which is about a 40% asymptomatic rate uh, with this particular virus. So that's where we are in the world with asymptomatic infection with COVID. Next slide. So then what about masking? So, you know, we've known since late February and early March that high viral loads come out of your nose and mouth, even when you're asymptomatic. Actually, the epidemiology had hinted at something crazy like that because it had been spreading way further than we ever could have imagined based on its genetic relatedness to SARS. And so because of that, that high viral shedding from your nose and mouth, even when you feel well, that really says, okay, cover that up to protect others. So masking guidelines were put out by the CDC on April 3rd. World Health Organization took um, quite a bit longer actually uh, and June 5th. And then here in the city of San Francisco, uh, masking was mandated on April 17th with a lot of enforcement and sort of stronger recommendations on May 28th. And a lot of evidence that you um, protect others by masking. But the question of this talk is how do masks protect you? So as we um, will, we can get into airborne versus droplet later, but really masks filter out a majority of viral particles, but not all. N95 uh, masks uh, filter out more and isolation masks and cloth masks filter out the majority of viral particles, depending on what it is, um, between 65 and 85%. And so the question is by wearing a mask, do you get exposure to less virus? And then does that lead to less severe disease? Next slide, please. So this is actually an age old concept. Um, so in 1938, this is the oldest paper I could find on it. Um, this was the first paper that describes this phenomenon that the less virus that you get in, the less inoculum that you get in, the less likely you are to get sick. So this is the concept of the LD50 or the lethal dose at which 50% of people get sick. Um, and this was a study in mice that it looked like a 50%, um, the LD50 of a particular virus was X. You know, when they gave too much virus, the, the poor mice died and a little virus, the mice didn't get very sick at all. So this is one of the oldest studies on this. Next slide. And then there's been a bunch of studies in other animals, but it isn't actually ethical to give humans a lethal virus and say, okay, you know, of what percentage do half of humans die? And so, um, so the studies in humans have been done with, with less lethal viruses. And so this was a study published in our premier um, infectious disease journal CID in 2015 that looked at giving humans influenza A in anticipation of a vaccine. And with this wild type influenza A, the more that you gave humans, the more sick they became. They had a lot of cough and shortness of breath. And if you gave them a little bit, they didn't get very sick at all. So that is some evidence in humans. And then finally, next slide. Um, this is a study from an animal study um, in hamster model. This was with SARS-CoV-2, the virus of interest of the day that causes COVID-19. I'm sorry, can you go to the next slide and I'll come back to this, sorry about that. Um, so this is a study in little hamsters. And um, in this case, what they did is simulated masking. They didn't actually put that tiny little mask on that tiny little hamster, but um, they uh, simulated masking with surgical mask partitions. And um, 
the masked hamsters or the ones under masked conditions were less likely to contract SARS-CoV-2. But beyond that, those who did contract SARS-CoV-2 had mild disease. They were less likely to get sick. Please go back to the previous slide. So indeed, this kind of idea of high infectious dose and causing more mortality um, was uh, the subject of a paper in Clause 1 in 2010, which looked at uh, why with the influenza 1918 pandemic, we had a higher mortality rate with our second wave than with our first wave. That's actually not usual. Usually you have more immunity going on and the second wave is much less sickening. Um, but in this case, our second wave with influenza, the pandemic in 1918, caused a higher mortality rate as seen on that um, slide on the right, on the picture on the right. And what this study postulated is it was that exposure to the higher infectious dose in the second wave with the crowding, with uh, World War I, with people being up too close together um, that led to that higher mortality rate. And that actually is reminiscent of what has been happening with SARS-CoV-2. At the very beginning of it, before we knew about masking, we saw a lot more exposure to higher doses. We saw healthcare workers getting more sick before we universally masked in this country around um, March 25th. We had greater deaths among healthcare workers in Italy and in New York. We didn't know about masking and certainly household contacts are more slight, likely to get sick than someone that is exposed to someone with SARS-CoV-2 um, outside of the household. Next slide and then next slide. So then let's go to the question of, okay, if we've convinced ourselves that viral inoculum matters, and that facial masking reduces that viral inoculum, then have we seen more asymptomatic infection under masked circumstances? And in places that mask, when cases go up, does severe illness and death go up? And then let's find with a, end with a uh, hopeful note that with asymptomatic infection, could you get immunity? And then you've really had your, um, you've had the benefit of increasing asymptomatic infection. Next slide. So this is a nice example, I think, of that question of um, do rates of asymptomatic infection increase under masked conditions? Um, I think cruise ships are nice places to do experiments. Unfortunately, you can't actually do the experiment again where you randomize a city to masking and randomize a city to unmasking and let it rip. But even though we're kind of doing that experiment in the United States at some level. But in this case, this is for cruise ships. So here, um, you know, these are closed settings. People aren't coming in and out. And in this case, um, one of the earliest examples of a cruise ship where there was an outbreak was the Diamond Princess cruise ship. And um, the proportion, and I referenced the article there, of asymptomatic infection was 18%. And no one was wearing masks, of course. We didn't even know about that. And then, of course, the CDC, as I told you, um, estimates the rate of asymptomatic infection of 40%. And then this later cruise ship, and this is, um, the study is here in the middle, the COVID-19 in the footsteps of Bernard Shackleton. This was an Argentinian cruise ship. And in this case, there was an outbreak. And they didn't let the cruise ship dock, but they must have thrown masks over to the side because they gave all the passengers surgical masks and they gave all of the um, crew N95 masks who were serving the passengers who were ill. And there was um, a spread, it's a closed setting. There was 128 of 217 passengers who got ill, but the rate of asymptomatic infection in that mass setting was 81% as opposed to 40% or 18%. And we've seen that in other settings. There was a pediatric hemodialysis unit outbreak in Indiana where everyone was masking. There were seroconvergence, but no one became ill. And then there were two recent outbreaks in the United States. One was in a seafood processing plant in Oregon, one was in a um, Tyson chicken plant in Missouri. And in both settings, the, the plants have been giving their workers masks. And there were major outbreaks in both, but 98%, 95% of workers remained asymptomatic. Next slide. And then do we see this um, kind of on a population level? Have we seen this ecologically? Have we seen this in other countries? I think we do need to pay um, a little more attention to what was going on in other countries. Absolutely, ecologically, these things are true. Beyond the fact that there are countries who are used to masking from the SARS pandemic, and that would be, of course, Singapore and Thailand and Vietnam and um, Japan and Hong Kong and other countries, it is true that as they opened up, uh, people really are good about masking. It's a very compliant masking environment and the cases went up and not deaths. But let's turn to a country that wasn't used to masking. This was the Czech Republic. And on March 23rd, 
the leadership of the Czech Republic said, you know what, everyone has to mask. And everyone was home and they were making like cloth masks and everyone masked. Um, and what happened is that they would open up and you can see the um, WHO data at the bottom. They would open up and they, and they would like get cases, but they wouldn't get severe illness. And then um, they kept masked and they didn't get those deaths and they've had a total of 359 deaths as of yesterday, I believe. And on May 11th, they eased the restrictions on wearing masks. So this was a truly kind of newly masked culture, which was the Czech Republic. Next slide. And one model shows in the references there um, that you can actually achieve a very low death rate um, in the setting of masking. This was a nice model that's been um, cited a lot, but if you look at social distancing after you ease your lockdown, that's the gray line. And you can see that there are a lot of, no, without masking, there are a lot of deaths. And then in this model, if you lift the lockdown, but 80% of the population is masking, then the death rate remains flat. flat. 50% masking doesn't give you as good of a death rate. So it's really that kind of 80%. That's where we get this idea that we want 80% of the population to mask. Um, and, you know, lockdown is a very blunt instrument, but it does enforce behavior change because if nothing's open, then you can't go anywhere. Um, but masking does take behavior change, like condoms um, or clothing, closing bath houses, you know, in 1983 in San Francisco. Um, condoms takes behavior change and so does putting on a mask. Next slide. So what about San Francisco? We do test a lot. Um, I think we're compliant. Um, I don't think everyone's quantitated it. Our asymptomatic infection is up. Um, and this is a, just from last week, um, a Bay Area technology company who labs processed, I think 30,000 tests and a majority of those were in asymptomatic or mild uh, uh, symptoms. And then this is the latest, latest San Francisco DPH data from this morning. And we do test a lot, 200,000 tests almost. Um, we have had cases go up since we eased restrictions here, but luckily since June 27th, we've only had one additional death. Um, so it was 50 on June 27th, where we had 3,500 cases and 1,450 cases later, just one additional death. So we are keeping death rates very low here, um, which is great. Next slide. Um, so is asymptomatic infection horrible is my last point. Yes, it's horrible because you can spread unwittingly. Um, you can have high rates of shedding from your nose and mouth, even when you feel fine. And that is the entire point why April 3rd, the CDC said mask up. However, the hopeful thing about asymptomatic infection is that it is possible you can get immunity without long-term consequences. And let's ignore this antibody stuff. I think, you know, um, many of us who work with viruses know that it really is cellular immunity that we should be looking at. Um, if we looked at HIV antibodies, that certainly doesn't protect you from infection. That is, um, that is in fact how you diagnose HIV. So let's think about cellular immunity. And there's a lot of hopeful papers coming out about cellular immunity with coronaviruses, with SARS-CoV-2. We've seen this with other coronaviruses. And um, one um, cited by Dr. Fauci yesterday uh, was about uh, um, giving uh, macaque SARS-CoV-2 infection and then protecting against re-challenge. Another hopeful sign for immunity is that unfortunately we're eight months into this pandemic and counting and we have not seen a single convincing case of reinfection. We've seen lots of long-term shedding but not a single case of um, reinfection that we're, we're persuaded about. And so that's very hopeful for immunity as well. And asymptomatic infection is less likely to give you those longer term consequences. So there are a lot of good things about asymptomatic infection. Next slide. So I'll just end with yesterday. Two days ago was a big day with, for masking. The MMWR put out this hairstylist salon that if you mask, no one was getting um, infected. The JAMA two days ago published this healthcare worker study from Boston that um, everyone in Boston, just like we did, did universal masking in hospitals with surgical isolation masks in March 25th. And we've been seeing healthcare worker infections very low since then. And basically the CDC director said two days ago, if we all masked up, we could get rid of this in four, six, eight weeks, we could be done. Um, and then next slide, yesterday wasn't a good day for masking. On the other hand, the Georgia governor explicitly voided masking orders in 15 localities yesterday. And so I would end this talk with let's stop this nonsense like Fauci has said and let's mask up. Do you wanna end with a final thing that really don't use those valve masks, those are actually bad for you. They, um, they exhale viruses, they, um, so don't use those ones with valves that we used during the fires.
And then final slide in conclusion, um, masking may have more than one advantage. During isolation, um, maybe the person at home should wear their mask like they do, but so should their contacts. This is an old theory that the less viral inoculum you get, the less severe disease. It's hopeful, but don't yell at people, don't wear their masks. I think harm reduction is better. Um, masking is very effective and maybe as effective as lockdown in one model. And let's look at other countries to see that. And the US unfortunately may become a natural experiment where some places mask and some places don't, but hopefully we won't um, see that much longer. And cell mediated immunity is a good thing. And let's look at that. And then the final slide is a picture from 1918. Um, next slide, where you could see this little cat. Um, and that cat is even masked. So if that cat can mask, we can mask it. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. So the cats can mask, the hamsters <laughs> cannot at, at this point. Uh, uh, people have asked about the type of mask. You, you didn't really go into cloth versus surgical versus N95. As you think through this theory, does it make any difference? I mean, it does, um, but that doesn't mean that people should be wearing N95 masks out there. And in fact, I'm quite very clear on that point, as we all are in the healthcare setting, that N95 should be um, kept for aerosol generating procedures for healthcare workers. That's really our decision here at UCSF and elsewhere. And so the N95s are also super uncomfortable and it cuts down on acceptability. So out there in the world, in the public, people can wear those surgical isolation masks or they can wear um, cloth masks. And that really is sufficient. We don't get into the breathing zones of people like um, you know you do when you're having someone giving someone a nebulizer. So this is really sufficient. And I looked back at the old data of masking, and this has been sufficient for airborne and droplet in public. Again, in public where you're not in people's faces. So it really is cloth or this. And uh, maybe one last question for you now before we move on. You mentioned the what we had to do to get people to wear condoms in uh, for HIV. There's a huge history in HIV of trying to figure out how you make behavioral change stick. Um, and that is in some ways the lessons here, it's sort of less important what the politicians do as, and more important what people do every day and the decisions they make. So what are, the, what are the lessons from HIV that we should be thinking about as we try to get people to universally mask without arresting them or finding them necessarily? Yeah, I mean, it really hit me yesterday when I was thinking about this talk about the bathhouses being closed in San Francisco in 1983. One way is to like shut down all of society and say like no one can have sex. And that was not, uh, and there was places where there was more transmission. So that's what happened. But actually be, the behavior change was something that was an individual decision that needed to be made, which was how people had sex and condoms and so forth. I think we have to think about harm reduction in this case. You can't yell at people. I actually don't, I totally agree with London Breed when she said, please don't yell at fellow San Franciscans. I think we have to think about harm reduction, 80% of the population masking, um, but closing down all society is the most blunt instrument you could get to how to stop a respiratory virus. And this is requiring us to each make our own decisions in doing this. And so I think if we think where it's protecting ourselves, maybe we can persuade people who have been against it to do it. And the other thing is I think people have to model it like politicians and you know Trump. Got it. Let's move on to Mike, uh, Michael Edmund, uh, gonna to speak to us about uh, uh, masking and, uh, and face shields and uh, how he and his colleagues are thinking about this in Iowa. Thank you, Bob. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today uh, and to talk a little bit here about face shields. Next slide. I, I think I can honestly say that uh, before uh, March 1st of this year, I probably had not thought about face shields for more than 30 seconds, uh, even as spending an entire career in hospital epidemiology. Uh, but what happened for us was we admitted our first COVID patient at the University of Iowa on March the 9th. Um, and uh, and um, one of the things we did um, as we were preparing for COVID to come and when COVID actually did come is to really critically look at our supply of uh, PPE, all of our inventory. And what became very clear is that on the surface, we had what appeared to be a lot of medical grade face masks, um, a couple of million. Uh, but when we started to do projections as, as to how many we might use and how long the outbreak might last, knowing that the supply chain had been severely disrupted because the factories in China had been shut down, we became quite nervous that if we did not get any additional supply, 
we wouldn't make it through the outbreak with uh, enough uh, face masks, and nor would we with N95s. We had even fewer N95s than medical masks. And I had some sleepless nights worrying about would we face the, the time when we'd have healthcare workers caring for COVID cases uh, with nothing on their face. So we started to think about whether we might be able to, to source face shields. And interestingly, because that supply chain wasn't disrupted, they're used in other industries, we were able to procure them. And so um, on uh, March 18th, we began supplying all of the people in our hospital with face shields. Uh, we prioritized uh, clinical workers first, uh, but within about a three week period, we had every person in our buildings uh, in face shields, including people who do not do uh, any kind of clinical care. So uh, for that, uh, the, that was our next step was to have face shields on everybody. You, we, you, we had masks and N95s available for people that were seeing patients that were either confirmed or suspect uh, COVID. Um, then we did uh, run into some, some luck and we were able to procure more face masks. Our inventory uh, improved dramatically. And then we added uh, medical masks for uh, the care, not only of COVID patients, but for all clinical care for all of our healthcare workers. Um, and then we continued to wear face shields uh, uh, universally uh, throughout our institution. Uh, and again, including people who do not do clinical work. Next slide. So face shields are really a very simple device. So there's essentially three pieces to them. Uh, the visor is the clear part that, that uh, surrounds your face, uh, which is attached to the frame. Um, and then they have a suspension. And some, sometimes the suspensions are more complicated and have knobs in which you can uh, tighten the, uh, the fit of the face shield. Sometimes those are just a plain elastic band. Next slide. So the optimal design of a face shield is that you, if you're going to wear one, you would want on the anterior surface for the face shield to come below the level of your chin. Laterally, you want it to come around your face and extend about to where your ear begins. And also you don't want a gap between your forehead and the visor. Um, some of the early 3D printed shields did have a big gap there. Uh, so that I think is a problem because droplets could come uh, down onto your face. And then there needs to be enough clearance so that you can wear your mask or a respirator um, or glasses. Um, and there are even face shields now that are designed that have a, a bigger space um, between your face and the visor uh, so that people can wear loops, for example. Next slide. There are really many different face shields that are now on the market. Um, uh, I, on my blog, I've tried to aggregate various websites. I think I have 90 different websites where you can order uh, face shields. On the left, you see what is more typical of an industrial type face shield. And this is actually what we've used mostly in the hospital because uh, early in the outbreak, that's what we could get. Um, in the middle there is, is sort of a more medical type face shield. Um, as well as on the right. This is one of the newer ones that's been developed. Uh, interestingly, there are no national standards uh, for the characteristics of a face shield. And that um, is somewhat problematic. And as we see, when you start to look at the literature on studies that have been done in face shields, um, you might not know whether this was a shield that provided really good coverage going all the way back to the ears or whether it was really just in the front of the face. And, and that, that continues to be a problem. Next slide. Um, this is a, a face shield. Uh, it's an interesting one uh, that's de developed by some, uh, some people at Harvard. Uh, and it's shown here uh, on the left in an opaque version, uh, just so that you can see the shape of it. Uh, what's interesting about this particular one is the coverage extends underneath of your chin, uh, which I think is quite nice. And I actually wore it last weekend. That's a picture of me uh, when I was making rounds uh, at the hospital. So the coverage of the shield it is, is highly variable, depend on the model that you have. Next slide. And then there's other ones. There are shields that are made to attach to baseball caps. Um, there are shields that are made specifically for kids that are fun ones uh, that will encourage them to wear them. Next slide. And there's even very special ones, like if you're a Devo fan, uh, they have the, uh, the dome shield uh, available for you that you can order online for, I think, $48.95. Next slide. 
Uh, and then there's also these, which I don't consider to be face shields, but if you read the face shield literature, these are often considered to be face shields. And you've probably seen these, they're often used in operating rooms. Uh, these are surgical masks that have an integrated visor. Next slide. So face shields do have um, a number of advantages. Um, uh, many people find that they're more comfortable. They're not as hot as a face mask uh, are generally. Uh, a lot of people will feel less claustrophobic than when they're wearing a face mask. Uh, and they don't have any impact on breathing resistance. Uh, another great thing is that you can easily disinfect them. You can just wipe them off. Um, for people, and we've heard from a number of people who are hearing impaired, um, uh, they have a lot of problems when people wear face masks because they depend on seeing people's lips to understand speech. Um, and uh, I think less patient anxiety when people are in shields as opposed to masks. Um, they protect your eyes, which is really important that masks don't do that. And they also keep you from touching your face. There are some disadvantages. Some, some, some of them are optical. Sometimes you get glare. Um, if you're doing you know, certain procedures where you really need to have visual clarity, you may have some issues there. Sometimes there can be fogging, although a lot of them are now made with uh, anti-fogging properties. Uh, the industrial ones are bulky. They're kind of heavy. Some people get neck pain when they wear them for long periods of time. Um, but they do have a peripheral fit that is uh, not uh, as tight as a face mask, obviously. Next slide. So once we got everybody in the hospital in a face shield, one of the things I started to think about, and this was in early April, uh, was maybe we should think about getting face shields out into the community. Um, and so uh, this was a, a JAMA viewpoint that I wrote with uh, Dan Dikema and Eli Princevich here at Iowa. And so we, uh, we hypothesized that if you could have universal adoption of face shields, in addition to the other things like testing, contact tracing, hand hygiene, et cetera, you could drive the R not less than one and the outbreak would end. Um, and we, we uh, based this on the fact that um, what we were seeing in the epidemiology of this disease is that the primary driver appears to be droplet transmission. Um, the one thing, of course, that hasn't been done um, is that we don't know how well face shields work for source control. Um, there, and, and as you'll see, there haven't been lots of studies done uh, on face shields, uh, but clearly they do provide protection from droplets. How well they protect on the other side as a source control, uh, we don't yet know. Next slide. This uh, viewpoint was published uh, this week uh, in JAMA by uh, my Klumpus uh, and colleagues at Harvard. Um, and this gets to the core of the debate that's been going on about whether this is a droplet transmitted disease or an aerosol transmitted disease. Um, and I think most of us accept that there are, there are gonna be cases of both. But I think a lot of what we are talking about is what's the predominant mode of how this disease is being transmitted. And the breakout quote there, I think, is important. Um, he says that demonstrating that speaking and coughing can generate aerosols or that it's possible to recover viral RNA from the air doesn't prove that you have aerosol based transmission. Next slide. And his argument about why it's not an aerosol, uh, primarily aerosol based transmission for COVID, um, um, are there are two. One is that the, uh, the basic reproductive number is 2.5, which uh, Dr. Milton talked about earlier. Uh, that's not consistent with other viral respiratory uh, illnesses that are transmitted in an aerosol way, like measles, in which the R0 is up to 18, or chicken box. And the secondary attack rates are really on uh, the low side. So overall, it's about 5%. Um, sort of casual interactions, like in a grocery store, something like a half a percent, sharing a meal with a person, 7%. And then even in households, uh, you can see that the, that the attack rate's somewhere between 10, maybe up to 40%. Uh, but that's not consistent with aerosol diseases like, for example, chickenpox, where prior to vaccine, if one kid in a household got chickenpox, you could rest assured that pretty much all the rest of the kids in that household would get it too. Next slide. So what are the data for face shields? So here's what we have. These are some simulation experiments that have been done. Uh, 
I think the first two are really the only two that are applicable to sort of community type um, transmission. So there is a cough aerosol simulator study that used influenza virus. Um, and and it, using an 8.5 uh, micron aerosol, there was 96% reduction um, in uh, retrie retrieval of virus uh, at 18 inches. Uh, this was a cough that was 18 inches from the person being exposed. Uh, and 92% at 72 inches. Uh, and then a smaller aerosol, it was 68% reduction uh, at 18 inches. Another study just used fluorescent dye and sprayed it. This was a five micron spray uh, and showed that when a face shield was on a mannequin, that there was no contamination of the eyes, the nose or the mouth at uh, 20 inches. The next three studies are really not community type studies. These are procedures, uh, simulations. One is a simulated dental procedure, one a femoral osteotomy, another uh, simulated surgery with a water spray. So these would be like things that would be more likely to occur uh, in a procedural suite or in the operating room. Um, and as you can see uh, for the dental procedure, um, the surgical mask under the shield did get contaminated for the femoral osteotomy, um, there was eye contamination of the mannequin about 30% of the time. And then with the, the water spray, 40% contamination of an inner uh, mask, 6% contamination of the face. Um, these obviously in, in these types of procedures, we would never recommend that a healthcare worker wear a, uh, a face shield uh, without mask or a respirator uh, underneath of it. Next slide. There's one observational study um, that I could find. There was a case control study uh, of nurses that was done uh, in Hong Kong, large hospital in Hong Kong. And what they found was that it, the nurses who wore face shields during aerosol generating procedures uh, were protected against developing um, uh, influenza-like illness um, and compared to those that just wore a face mask. Um, and it was a pretty significant reduction with an odds ratio of 0.12. Next slide. And then um, the, the last study that I'll show, uh, and I won't review because this is Dr. Milton's study that he talked about, um, but this was the human challenge transmission study with influenza virus. Um, and as you can see, uh, one group had face shields, hand hygiene, and, and no face touching. So uh, we're, we're looking at whether there could be aerosol transmission. The control group didn't have a face shield, no hand hygiene, and they were allowed to touch their face. So this would mimic more like contact and droplet transmission, but there were very low uh, infections. So you see zero in the intervention group, uh, one infection in the uh, control group. Next slide. So really in a nutshell, this is what we have. We have some data that look at how a shield works uh, in a person who's being exposed to uh, an infected source. Um, what we don't have data on is uh, how well does a shield work for source control? Um, and we have no data either on a dual, sh dual uh, shield model or a universal shielding model, which is what we're arguing for in our JAMA viewpoint, where both the source and the exposed uh, have on a face shield. Uh, we do have now at the University of Iowa a cough simulator, so we are going to be doing studies looking at these scenarios, as well as comparing face shields to face masks. Next slide. So I think that this whole uh, controversy about whether it's airborne or whether it's droplet um, is somewhat driven by the framework through which you look at, at the issue. Um, and I think there's two major frameworks here. You have an occupational health framework and a public health framework. And in the occupational health framework, um, the type of work that, that people who work in occupational health do, they are really uh, looking uh, at things with a very, very low risk tolerance. And the goal generally is that you're gonna drive the risk to the irreducible minimum. And so if you think about um, going back to kind of basic epidemiology, and thinking about the difference between effectiveness and efficacy, they're really focused on efficacy. They're looking for how do you provide ideal protection to people? Um, and they're looking at it really at an individual level. 
On the other hand, in the public health uh, framework at a population level, um, we'll generally tolerate more risk than you would at an individual level. And the goal at a population level is not to prevent every case of COVID that could be prevented. The goal is to try to get the R naught less than one and stop the outbreak. And so the focus is really on effectiveness. And effectiveness answers the question, how well does your intervention work in the real world? And of course, that factors in adherence. So for example, we could, we could say to the general public, we want everybody to wear an N95 uh, respirator. But I think it's highly unlikely that most people would do it because they're not very comfortable. Um, so, so I think effectiveness from a public health standpoint is how we're looking at this. And it's really, uh, I think, much more of a utilitarian perspective as opposed to an individual perspective. Next slide. So in conclusion, I think in the hospital setting, uh, we are using face shields. We've been using face shields since the beginning of, of, of the COVID outbreak at our hospital, but those should be used with uh, face masks or in the setting of aerosol generating procedures and 95 respirators. In the community, on the other hand, uh, next slide, so particularly since we have 25 states now that still have no mask mandate, I think the best face covering is the one that people will wear. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. That was uh, that was terrific and really <laughs> thought provoking. Uh, let me have a couple questions for you. And by the way, uh, the audience were a little long, so we'll go over and go till about uh, one twenty or so, so uh, twelve or so minutes for uh, to bring everybody back. Um, is there any evidence that people will be more likely to wear them? Has that been studied either in focus groups or in the real world? If you gave people the choice of you can wear a face shield or you can wear a mask that people will prefer face shields? There are no data that I'm aware of. We're doing some surveys of our healthcare workers to ask about that and asking uh, them not just uh, because they're wearing both, many of them, um, how one compares to the other, but what happens when you leave work and go to the grocery store? Do you wear a face shield, face mask? So we should be getting some data on that. Yeah. Do you have a sense of what people do? Do they choose one or the other? Um, well, I'd say in my own experience, when I go to the grocery store um, in Iowa City, I, I would say we have about, uh, I'd say 80 to 90 percent compliance with face coverings in general. Mm -hmm. um, so a pretty compliant community. Um, but uh, I would say five to 10 percent of that is face shields and the rest is face masks. Okay. And here at, at UCSF Health System, we are moving to uh, mask plus goggles of some eye covering of some sort. How do you compare and contrast face shields versus that strategy? It sounds like you have masks for, for, for people with direct patient contact, it's masks plus face shield. So here the question is face shield versus goggles as a secondary. Uh, uh, I think the one advantage for face shield versus goggles is that the shield protects your mask or your N95. Uh, from getting droplets on it, and, and then you might potentially contaminate yourself as you touch that. And but otherwise, it protects your eyes, and that's that's important. Okay. Uh, actually, let's bring on the others because I'm going to get to a couple other questions that are probably for everybody to bat around. So if uh, we can bring on Monica and Don, that would be great. And hopefully, we've gotten Don's sound uh, trouble shot. Um, Maybe I'll stick with you for a second, Mike, but then open it up and particularly interested in how Don responds to this. I, I kind of get the public health argument. We're not trying to bring it to zero. We're trying to bring the community down to make the virus go away. But we're all individuals in the community. When I go out, I want it to be zero. <laughs> I'm over 60. I don't particularly want to get COVID. So, um, you know, and, and you and others have said it's, it's not primarily aerosol based, it's primarily droplet based, but primarily doesn't mean that it's not aerosol based at all. And I'm wearing this face shield and I've got big spaces around the side of my face and the, and the bottom and all that. So how do, you, how do you sort of think that through, you know, to make people comfortable that um, you think about an aerosol, it feels like there's this fog and people have often likened it to, you know, cigarette smoke. If you can smell it, then that's an aerosol. You sort of know that it's going to get around a facial. You probably know it's going to get around a surgical mask as well. But how do you talk through that kind of uh, concern about aerosols? Yeah. So I think uh, that question that you just asked and, and many of the questions that we faced, both uh, in trying to do infection control in the hospital um, and also at for the university, I, I'm on a committee that's trying to advise the university about what we're going to do, how we're going to protect students and faculty, et cetera. 
you know, I think all of those questions come down to what's your risk tolerance. And it's a very individual, personal thing. Some people aren't worried about it. Um, and others really are. And I think that it's, you work with the, the, if you're a physician, you work with your patient. I mean, if your patient has, let's say, um, a, has had a bone marrow transplant, they're highly immunosuppressed. You know, I would advise that patient they should have an N95 um, and, and, face, and, and eye covering uh, when they uh, are out in public. Mm -hmm. um, in a 20 year old, I would think about that, that same question differently. So to me, it's a, a lot of it is about what their tolerance is for risk. Got it. Don, I'd love to hear you sort of react to sort of these more clinical presentations as you think about the science of, of how the virus uh, spreads. Uh, what, what are your impressions and maybe particularly address the face shield question? Well, I think that's really interesting. You know, in the, the Van Tam study that um, uh, Michael had up there for a minute, uh, you know, one of the things we did in the preparing for that was trying to come up with a face shield that didn't reduce aerosol exposure. And it was really hard. Uh, we actually had to have one that didn't come around the side of the face and didn't come below the chin. So we basically had to cut down and just protect against large droplet or dr ballistic drop sprays. Uh, and... Um, so, so and, and I think one of his slides very nicely showed that, um, that, that uh, I think it's the NIOSH data shows in, in their mannequin study, about a two thirds reduction in aerosol exposures. Now, you know, one of the things is, is, is you guys are using the medical terminology, I'm using the occupational health and aerobiology, aerosol science terminology for an aerosol. So for me, a lot of what you call droplets are aerosols, and there's and then you have in my world there's splash and spray, which are, uh, you know, uh, we I like to say we aerobiologists like to argue about whether a cow in a tornado is a bioaerosol, but you know, big things that are imparted with momentum from where then they came, I don't think of as aerosols. I think of that as splash drops. And, and so that's what face shields are really originally designed around, but they are actually protecting against the coarser aerosols and even a little bit, as we saw, against the fine aerosols. So, you know, I, I, I think we are, one of the things I hope comes out of this uh, pandemic is that we begin to get our terms straight across medicine and, and industrial hygiene because uh, you know, I, I, I fear that medicine is kind of stuck in this dichotomy that goes back to Chapin's 1910 textbook, and it hasn't been updated with all this stuff that's been done since 1940. Uh, and, but, uh, so I think we can come to a much more nuanced understanding of this. I, I definitely think that the stuff about dose response is really important, but I also think as a part of that is that root of exposure is probably very important too. We know that there are anisotropic infections like uh, anthrax as a bacterium that's clearly got that. Uh, adenovirus is that way. In fact, the adenovirus vaccine takes advantage of it by giving people a capsule of adenovirus. So they get a GI infection and they, they don't get sick. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas by inhalation, uh, even in the army, you have young recruits die of it once in a while. So it, I, I think that, that we're, we're really not that much on a different page as it sounds like sometimes. Uh, and, and I think that uh, the, the universal masking and, uh, and the face shields are uh, something that we can begin looking at uh, as we get more data. And I'm thinking maybe I should be putting people into my Gesundheit machine with uh, face shields on, not just with face masks. We are testing people's homemade face masks that they bring with them too. Uh, to look well, it at. sounds like there is evidence though of conjunctival. That is one of, I think you mentioned that there are receptors in the eye. Absolutely, yes. It makes some sense to be, if we can have eye covering. Um, Monica, you, part of the evidence that you cited for your theory was the increased rate of asymptomatic infections. And part of it was maybe a lower mortality rate in people who are wearing masks. Uh, 
but there are there are alternative explanations for both of those. Uh, you know, younger people getting infected, and other things that we do, new medicine, you know, medicines that are partly effective and proning and all that kind of stuff. So how do you dissect that out and be sure that we're not getting faked out and saying it's because of the mass as opposed to other things? I actually do think it's multifactorial um, uh, why we are having low death rates, thank God, in the city and um, and why we the death rates even around the country are not as high. I don't think it's exclusively because of us. I think that would be a non-nuanced interpretation. I think this is partially Masking is partially one of the most important things we can do, um, but so is steroids and remdesivir and treatments that are getting better in the last three months. So it is, what's been so exciting is, I don't think I've ever seen anything, and I wasn't around at the very beginning of HIV, but where things are moving so quickly in terms of progress and how science is informing everything that we should be doing. And then I've also been frustrated because politics is informing it more than it should be in this particularly polarized time. And we have really good scientific things that have happened in the last four months, including the knowledge of something so simple, but it requires behavior. And um, I think combined with all everything put together, we can get through this pandemic faster. I really believe that. Yeah. So boy, if we could get out of this in the next four to six weeks, every single one masked, that would be amazing. Yeah, uh, we had John Barry, the author of uh, The Great Influenza on a couple of weeks ago here, and he had an editorial in the Times yesterday, and the first line I thought was brilliant. It was, uh, when, you mix, when you mix science and politics, you get politics. Yeah, <laughs> it's the dominant, yeah. Captured things very well. Um, maybe it's both for Don and Mike, you know, Mike and your role is trying to do infection control and, and or infection prevention in your health facility and Don from the scientific standpoint or the, the more engineering uh, uh, view. When you talk about ventilation, I sort of think ventilation is good and that's why I like being outside and not inside. And then Don, you got me scared that we blow the virus around and instead of it only traveling three or four feet, it's now gonna travel like a football field. And now I'm scared. <laughs> so is ventilation good or bad or is it both? And how do you think that through? And well, we start, I, Don, but then I'd love to hear Mike's thinking about that in sort of the healthcare, uh, the, the context of how we organize ourselves in a healthcare system. We, we got asked that same question on the Today Show this morning, I think it was. Um, I feel good. I feel good about that. Thank you. <laughs> the, the, uh, it, it, it can cut both ways. So, it, you know, ventilation in the t engineering lingo means bringing in dilution air. It does. It means dilution ventilation, uh, not just blowing the air around. And in that restaurant in Guangzhou, one of the problems was they had sealed up the exhaust vents. And, uh, you know, had they had the exhaust vents there, they wouldn't have had the buildup at that end of the room. And they might not have had, there might've been no story at all. Uh, and so I, and I think this is, gets to the point of, uh, uh, of uh, how do we, um, you know, why I would like to get this terminology thing straight because it could be droplets that what you would call droplets, but they were 10 or 15 microns, but they were being suspended in air. So they're an aerosol to me mm -hmm. um, that, that was involved in that Guangzhou restaurant, right? But that it, what, what, uh, when I speak of an aerosol, I mean something that ventilation would have an impact on. Mm -hmm. that pollution ventilation could help with, yep. which is not gonna help with a splash or a spray but it will help with stuff that's floating in the air. And I think that much of what we're hearing about what is working with, with surgical masks or face coverings and with face shields is all talking about the same thing, something that ventilation can also help with. And which is why the Japanese ministry points to uh, uh, having uh, closed, poorly ventilated places, crowds and close contact intersecting to be the high risk environments. That, I think that is, it is really confusing because you think about that restaurant and that the air conditions on, there's no, there's no sort of exhalation valve and it's blowing across the restaurant four tables away. It feels like that has to be what we would think of as aerosol. It has to be sort of the equivalent of smoke as opposed to a droplet, a magic droplet flying 15 feet. But you're saying that it could be actually a droplet that goes that far. 
Well, it, but we would, it, a, a small it, droplet that's somewhere in between the two, I guess. It's, it's, it's probably, it's some kind of inhalable, probably thoracic fraction or respirable fraction. I'm not sure. And if it's respirable fraction, we'll all agree it's an aerosol. If it's in more, a little bit larger, you call it a droplet. I say it's still an aerosol because it floated on the air. That's, got it. Got it. Um, Mike, how do you think about all of this and the role of ventilation and, and, and prevention? Oh, I mean, obviously in the hospital setting, uh, when we know that we have uh, COVID patients, uh, we have them in negative pressure rooms. Um, and, um, but, but sometimes patients are, um, you know, in a regular room and then they, and we make a diagnosis that we might have missed, you know, as they came in the door or something. Um, and we have to move them. But I guess the one sort of a uh, consolation to me is that we are really not seeing much in the way of nosocomial transmission within the hospital. Um, and um, we are not, we, we are not using very many uh, N95 respirators, uh, except for when we are doing a aerosol generating procedures. So, so with masks and shields and the ventilation that we have, it doesn't seem like we are perpetuating uh, the disease inside the hospital. Yeah. Um, maybe a couple last couple questions. Um, I think for which one of you mentioned fomites, maybe Don did, but it sounds like, you know, I'm trying to remember back to February or March, hard to remember. It feels like this feels like dog years, but you know, we were all just incredibly frantic about touching the mail and touching our nose and touching everything and, and, you know, and, and, and cleaning our hands every 10 seconds. At least the common thinking is it's less important. Is is that correct, or have we just gotten complacent about that? Don, why don't you start with that and maybe take that to others if you want? Well, I my, that's been my sense that you know relaxing on that hasn't seemed to have any impact. Well, how do we know? I mean, we yeah. certainly are seeing a ton of new cases. So, but yeah. what what's the evidence that that is a less important route of transmission? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm still being very careful with washing my hands. You are okay, uh, uh, but uh, because I don't know, I, 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 I'm on the precautionary principle. I'm gonna just be careful. Yep. All right. <laughs> Sounds like your principle is the same as mine, Mike. How, how do you think about uh, fomites? Well, I, I would say that my hand hygiene practices are probably at their baseline, uh, which are probably higher than the average person, but. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I don't worry much about that. Uh, that and and because if I generally if I'm going to touch something, I'm going to probably going to do hand hygiene, you know, not in 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 the near future. Uh, I don't. I just don't think that that seems to be the dominant mode of transmission. Um, I would say in Iowa City, the recent cases that we have had, um, particularly like in the lat in uh, around the beginning of the month. Uh, they were all uh, pretty much young people, people under the age of 25. And one uh, common factor was they all had been in bars. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you I, know, one thing I want to say shock, about that Shocking is, in, in a college town, but thank you. Yeah. You should have warned me that that was coming. Uh, Monica, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say that we, I think the reason we even thought of fomites is because we just couldn't figure out what was going on at the beginning. And mm -hmm. it's actually very clear what's going on. Um, you shed this at high rates, even when you feel well. And that asymptomatic transmission from the nose and mouth, I think, really speaks to the epidemiology of spread. And that is different. That's different than SARS. That's different than influenza. That's different than many viruses where you feel unwell when you spread it. And so um, I think the fomite surface issue I'm not very concerned about. And I, like you, I wash my hands as much as an infectious disease doctor does, which is a lot. Great. So maybe last question for, uh, I'd love to hear, Mike, what's going on in Iowa City? Are you seeing a surge and, and kind of what's the political environment around prevention there as well? Sure. So we did, uh, we did see uh, an increase in cases uh, sort of at the, uh, probably around the last week of June. Um, uh, that has now seemed to quiet down. Um, the, the, the issue in Iowa, which you probably are aware of, um, is uh, the meatpacking industry as a big driver of the number of cases um, and uh, uh, prisons, um, congregate settings, really. When people are, are, are densely packed together, uh, you start to see lots of cases. And I think we have been a great example of that. Uh, politically, we don't uh, in Iowa have um, uh, 
a mask mandate or much of any other kind of mandate. Um, and um, I do think if we could uh, do better with that, we could probably get these uh, our, our infection rates down. But right now, our infection rates continue to increase in Iowa. Yeah, and Monica, what what do you? Uh, I'm struck by the same thing you mentioned, which is I pretty impressive when I walk around. I may be walking only in certain neighborhoods, but people do seem to be wearing masks a lot, and yet we're seeing a moderately impressive surge, not Houston or Miami or Phoenix, but but real. Uh, how do you how do you process that? Yes, I mean, I don't think masks prevented completely. I think that when people mingle, masks may lead to lower rates of severe illness, but don't com prevent it completely, which really puts all together these three talks, right? Like that, um, that no one's wandering around with um, like whatever they wear in Contagion in those movies. Like we have masks and masks filter out the majority of, of viral particles. So as we open up and as other places have opened up, there have been cases and um, that has been seen here. And what has been a big relief has been the, the low death rate um, here and many other places. Um, and that was seen in the Czech Republic and everywhere else they would see the cases um, back off as we have here, but not see the increase in deaths. And I think that's what's hopeful about the mask wearing in conjunction with cases. Man, last question, Don, you were talking about airplane flight and the, the audio was bad, but it sounded like you were talking about how the, the sort of swirl that comes up from the people and down from the ventilation <laughs> system and it's, it's sort of bad, but I think a lot of people are trying to decide whether to fly. And after hearing the three of you, I guess I'm not sure I'm closer to what the right decision is. So take us through that for a second and then I'd love to hear whether Mike and Monica would fly this summer. Well, I'm waiting for the, the, the general rate in the population in the country to go down before I get on an airplane. I mean, I, I am trying to be extremely safe because my father, who's 102, is still living alone with his wife whom he's taking care of. And, uh, and I'm trying to stay safe so that I can visit him safely. Yeah. Uh, and so I am being super cautious about a lot of things. Um, and in airplanes, the, the, you know, you have the gaspers and you have the air flowing down over your body, but the heat plume from your body is trying to go up. So hopefully, eventually airplanes will be redesigned so the air goes up because that's the way it wants to go. Then you have plug flow and you would have much less exposure because now when you're pushing it down and it's trying to go up, it goes sideways and that's the problem. So, um, yeah, and, and here in Maryland in College Park, we're in Prince George's County, the hottest county in the state of Maryland. And just west of the campus is a zip code where 80% of the people are non-citizens and it has the highest attack rate in the state. Cumulative attack rate is about 5% at this point in that zip code. Uh, so we have a lot of problems here. And in the state, although among people over 65, the new case rate is dropping rapidly it is rising rapidly under 35 in the 20s. So you're really worried about who else is gonna be on the plane and the increased probability that there's somebody who's gonna be infected on the plane. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mike, do you wanna take that? Would you fly? Yeah, well, I actually was on a plane uh, yeah. a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Um, I wore an N95. Um, the flights were for the most part, not very crowded and, and on and, one and, limb- and, and face shield or just- I had my part. face shield with me. I did not put it on because there was no one within six feet of me. Hmm. Um, and in one of my flights, I was the only passenger. It's reasonably safe. And, and <laughs> I, I, for that I'm beyond the incubation period. So I did not get COVID. All right, good. And Monica, last word. Yes, I would. I would fly. And again, you're you're getting everyone's individual biases and everyone's individual, everyone's tolerance. So yes, I would fly with the mask. I believe in the mask. Got it. Okay. <laughs> thank thank you all. Really grateful. It's a really complicated but uh, extraordinarily important discussion and topic. And I think you cleared up a whole bunch of it. And there are areas that just aren't clear until the science gets better. So thank you. Uh, thank you all for that. Uh, thank you all for watching and listening. You see, hopefully, on the screen our. Uh, our wonderful production team who brings these to you each week. And I thank all of them. And uh, we'll be back next week. I'm not quite sure what we'll talk about, but uh, there will be something. And uh, we'll continue doing this until this is all better. Thanks so much. Have a great week. Stay safe.